Hello and welcome on Adagio Live. The cello suites by Bach are so much part of our everyday life, of our environment, of our cultural DNA, that we tend to forget how daring and improbable this um, project could be in the beginning of the 18th century. We are talking about an extraordinary work, a grandiose uh, opera of two and a half hours. I mean, if you think about it, two and a half hours, this is the duration of a Mozart opera where there is usually an orchestra, uh, singers, mise en scène, dancers. And we are talking here about the same duration, about the same intensity, for uh, performed exclusively by one player of a string instrument with four strings. And uh, on top of that, an instrument that is not, uh, that is not supposed to be a harmonic instrument. Um, I think only Bach and maybe a few others could go after such a daring uh, project. And it was, I think, very much in his, uh, in his temperament. And what Bach did with this uh, castle in the desert, as I, uh, put, as I put the title on this series, uh, is that he not only overcame the limitations of our instrument, that meaning that indeed it is not a keyboard instrument or a harmonic instrument, but in a genius stroke, he turned it around and used the limitations of our instrument, its boundaries, as a tool for the expression of these suites. What I mean to say is that I think one of the reasons this work has become one of the most popular works of music in the world, uh, all genres uh, 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 together, it's because there is a poetry of, of this limitation, of the fact that harmony and melody have to go hand in hand uh, in a very uh, melted way, in a very ambiguous way, that gives something which seems almost like an improvisation, like a richer carré. And uh, to come back just for a second to what I said at the beginning of this, the, the reason I said castle in the desert is that, first of all, yes, I see this work as a castle, as an immense, wonderful one, because again, these two and a half hours is like a journey through uh, basically all the emotions that um, uh, we humans go through, you know, uh, love, longing, sorrow, uh, hope, joy. And the thing is that Bach, like all uh, great geniuses, like Beethoven, for example, he constructed his castle uh, not with the most uh, stunning marbles, not with gold, but with simple material. Uh, which is something, you know, that we know from later on from Beethoven, one of the most uh, famous example uh, being uh, ta 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 and then uh, from this you build a great symphony. Here it's a bit similar, um, as we will see, for example, in today's uh, prelude. Um, before I go in the substance into this prelude. I want um, to, to thank 
all of you who have sent your questions, comments, ideas uh, through Facebook and Instagram or through uh, my uh, uh, page, uh, my website. Um, and also I want to tell you something very, very, very thrilling for me, very, very special, is that uh, uh, today's guest, because my intention and my hope is to have in each episode of this uh, series on the bar suite is to have one guest uh, who tells us his or her vision uh, of the bar suites and today's guest uh, is living legend of the choreography uh, and a person who has inspired me in a way that i cannot put in words uh, Anne Teresa de Kersmaker she will come uh, in, uh, in about 10 minutes after we talk of today's topic, uh, which is the prelude from the first suite. So, as I um, uh, mentioned before, uh, Bach likes to take a very modest material, work on it and, and show us, or not to show us, but make us feel that with something simple, you can, you can build great things. You can lift up the soul. So, um, the beginning of the prelude of the first suite, uh, not only you all know it, and you have heard it so many times, but um, the whole world, basically, because I think it even made it to some uh, commercials, uh, which is probably a sign that how successful it is. So I will play it now. <laughs> And basically what is it? It's only three notes, a chord, G major, you know. Ornamented. He ornaments the, the higher voice. And then we repeat. And then the next chord. And then the next chord. So, in a way, Bach is a bit playing with us because by doing this, he's almost suggesting that composing for cello is not so different than composing for a keyboard instrument, for a harmonic instrument. Uh, another piece that you all know uh, because either you played it or your neighbor or your daughter or your parents is of course I'm so nervous. So, but anyways, the reason I wanted to play this is that you see how similar uh, this music is. It is ex exactly the same idea. Prelude, first prelude of Volta Imperiatus Clavier, and first prelude of the bar suite. It's chords that are arpeggiated and that are presented uh, to you to say, it's a statement by Bach to say harmony is the alpha and omega. This is the air we breathe, uh, in, in which we can then start telling stories. The difference between the two pieces is that in the Volta Imperius Clavier, in this first prelude, the entire prelude is composed of these chords, and, um, with the exception of the very last final cadenza, which is a bit improvised. Whereas in our um, prelude, very quickly, Bach will start to uh, give us a sort of a, a fresh breeze of improvisation between the pattern. So first he gives the pattern to basically to set, set the stage, uh, as, as we've seen before. <laughs> brings us to something which seems to be the same but which is the which 
which is suddenly goes a different way, as if our little bach, our little river, suddenly had one arm that went free. And he's going to do this um, as we go on more and more. Here. <laughs> What he did here uh, was he, he, he set us not only free, but he brought us up to a register we hadn't explored yet. And then again, our bass, and then see here, two bars of improvisation. And now comes a moment which I find, well, where there is a little detail which could seem technical, but I find it very touching and very representative of how Bach works to, to construct tension and release in order to construct a phrase. We now come to a, a series of two small modulations of two bars each. The first one in A minor. And the next one in E minor. And then we go, actually, we are already on our way back, basically, to G major. Uh, the, the detail I wanted to catch your attention to in these four bars, in these two plus two bars, is this. The first modulation, uh, Bach presents it not from the bass note, which would be the normal way, which is what we've had as a pattern. Always from the bass for this, for this motif. Here, on the moment of a first modulation, which is quite uh, um, special, uh, he presents this modulation not from the bottom note, not from the bass note, which would be, uh, you know, something like this, like a, another composer would might have done. No, he does it from the middle note. Okay, so. And this gives more expression, more desire, one could say, to the, for the new tonality, whereas the resolution of it, the next bar, is from, again, from the bass note, normal. And the next modulation, this is what, where I wanted to bring you, the next modulation of two bars, the modulation itself is from the bass note, making less dramatic, less uh, tense than the one two bars before, but then the resolution itself, which in terms of in harmonic terms should be like a, a release, but he gives it more expressivity by uh, uh, presenting this resolution from the third, not from the bottom note. <laughs> So, these are all uh, little wonderful details. We could spend two hours going into this piece and, and admiring how Bach um, uh, creates exp exp expectations and then deceives them and then brings us that way to his story, you know, to, to travel. Um, this is really, really something very moving. But there is one thing I have to say in words because of course, this way of communication, which we have here, and I'm very happy to, 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 be, to have this way of, of communication with you, is in terms of sound and dynamic, of course, quite limited. So, uh, and nevertheless, I want to pass on to you, uh, uh, out there, uh, my, my cello colleagues who are out there, uh, uh, something that I learned from Anna Bailsma when I was 25 years old, an amazing master course only on the bar suites, and which was a revelation. He really 
uh, Arnold Belsma, pioneer of the Baroque cello, who uh, inspired, I think, all of us cellists in a way that we cannot describe. And he passed away last year, unfortunately, and we miss him dearly. Uh, but what I wanted to say is that he uh, explained to us and showed us and demonstrated us something that was very, very precious for me and I want to pass it on to you. When you play a harmony not from the bottom note, but from an upper note, either from the middle voice or from the soprano, uh, you have to give a bit more um, substance, a bit more timbre, a bit more contact with the bow. To the sound uh, in order to suggest to your listener that yes there is here a bass note that you don't hear yet that probably will be presented later in the bar uh, but it is there and this is what could help you to decide where to emphasize the tone a bit more or at other passages a bit less um, i think well, the last thing I want to say about this prelude, and then um, I, I would love to uh, to go to our dialogue with Anne Teresa de Kersmaker. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that what's fascinating in this prelude, and Bach does it also in the uh, prelude from the third suite, is that uh, when we reach half the, the, the middle of this prelude, um, so after one and a half minute of music, all the rest, all the second half of, um, of this prelude is going to be um, a series of improvisation, if you would like, scales, arpeggios, going down, going up, uh, adding some harmonies, which are a bit... Uh, which are quite dramatic, or also... So-called Napolitan intervals, which make very expressive. All of this is happening on a pedal of D. Again, a virtual pedal of D, because we are cellist and because we are not organist or pianist, where we could play, you know, have this D held there. So it's made in a very subtle way. But why does Bach do this? The, the, I think the very reason he does this is to create, you know, when you stay on the same chord in a way for a very long and, and, and improvise and, and go down and up. Huh? We are still there, we are still there, we are still there. And we are going to go on to half scale and everything. And this wonderful series of scales. And then a sort of ostinato, something that rolls in itself by being a, the same kind of movement. Going up. Yourself, you, you are starting to say, well, okay, well, this D, D, but when is the G coming? When is this coming? So he, he, he raises your desire for the resolution for G major. But we are not done yet. The last thing he does on his ascension is the chromatic movement, which is very much in Bach and very much in most composers is a sign of accumulating tension and drama. And then it brings us to this glorious cadence. Uh, where did you notice? I'm sure you did. Uh, he reverses our original motif. And remember, as Anna Belsma has taught us, from the top, if you present your cards from the top, it's more generous, it's more expressive. And this is why, uh, this is how Bach manages 
with a very simple motive of three notes, basically, to lift us up to something so positive. And just a little remark um, about, um, about this. Uh, it made me think, as I was preparing for this, and I was again amazed by, by Bach's, uh, you know, capacity to, 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 yeah, to give us uh, a joy and, and to, to make us grateful, you know, for, for, for being alive. Well, and I remembered this was composed at a time where death was omnipresent. Bach had 20 children, 13 of which passed away as, as, as children. Uh, 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 he was working so hard. He was not living in, you know, incredibly, incredible conditions. And then he does, he does this gesture in his, in his music. And this I find again and again an amazing inspiration and maybe um, uh, I hope that in these times it can help those of you who are particularly affected by the events to find, uh, to find hope and see the light at the end of the tunnel. I had written amazing questions by all of you um, about, um, about so many different topics. It's amazing. I got messages from you about ornamentation, about the phrases, the line, about uh, my experience with choreography, how did it influence my playing, uh, about technical questions, about how to relax the left hand when playing Bach, which is sometimes tough. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I was more discursive than I hoped. I've, I've, re I've spoken more than 20 minutes. And so please, um, uh, I will. I promise to go at these questions, which I find so fascinating. Maybe next time I will also do a flashback to this prelude because there were some very interesting questions about this prelude in particular. Please forgive me for not uh, going at them today. Uh, um, I will next time be uh, shorter in my discourse and will be able to spend more time uh, on the questions uh, that you sent me. And please keep sending whatever comes to your mind. Um, either on my Facebook, on my Instagram, on my um, uh, website, or at Life. Now, it is such um, an honor to introduce Anne Teresa, the Cares Maker. Dear Anne Teresa, are you there? I will come a bit closer here and will take my earphones. And yes, I see you and I will hear you in a minute. So, um, Anne Teresa, thank you so much, so much, so much for being with us today for this first atelier. Um, to, to the people who are listening and watching, um, I, um, I, I, that was a bit, it's a dream come true. I, when I started the idea of this series and I said, I need to, to have the input of, of people who have uh, um, given uh, attention and love to Bach, and um, my first uh, dream was that Aunt Teresa would have the time to be with us. So thank you um, uh, very much, Aunt Teresa. Aunt Teresa, my first question um, uh, to you. Um, we had uh, this extraordinary journey together in the last three years with the project uh, Mitten wir in Lebensind, which is your choreography of all six um, uh, cello suites by Bach. Um, um, I will develop on another day how this has had a great influence on my playing and everything. But for now, my question to you, you have uh, done a lot of choreography of Bach. Before uh, we did Mitten, you had done Toccata, you had done Partita, uh, you, uh, later on you did the Brandenburg Concertos. And so could you tell us and share with us what is specific about the cello suite? What was different for you in the cello suite? Um, um, that, that where you, you, you saw, oh, here one has to work differently. Okay. Um, actually, I started to do my very first work in 19, 
81, when I was in New York, working on the music of Steve Reich. And the music that was there were the Brandenburg concertos, and for the rest, violin phase of Steve Reich. Uh, at that point, it was the beginning of my trajectory as a choreographer, but I didn't, I was fascinated by the music of Bach. It was for me a direct invitation to dance, but I didn't feel ready for it at all. So it was many years before I started with Bach. And then indeed I did work to, um, um, on Portata, I worked on different musics of Bach. Um, but it was not until I worked with you that I considered, I made the choice of taking this completeness of the six suites. You know how it happened. You came to see me. You said you want to work with me. You said, I, I thought I wanted to have this relationship with you from one to one. And I must say in this last seven, 20 minutes that we have spent now in here, this is like recalling what happened during the rehearsals. And I was, uh, it was, uh, it was such an unbelievable experience, Jean Quien. You know, it was the way you shared your craftsmanship, your poetry, your historical knowledge, your wit, your uh, in a very natural, always technically articulated. That I was, that I was a little bit like, hmm. <laughs> My moments, I was impressed. I, I, I took the knowledge like a sponge and it was an extremely honor. And it was for me as a choreographer who worked for more than 30 years at that point, it was such an enormous leap uh, forward. Originally the plan was to do first the Brandenburger and then the Shallow Suites. But then for practical reasons, I decided I first want to go with the Shallow Suites because of this, what you exactly said, mentioned at the beginning of your thing, this, what for me Bach is on one hand, la lucidité ensoleillée, you know, this clarity, it's a direct invitation to dance. Not only what, you know, what moves us, what, but what makes us move. And I'm not only referring to the fact that there are Allemands and Gigue, all these pre-classical dance forms, which are leading, are really direct invitation to dance. It's not only that, it, but it's also this, uh, this economy of means and this maximalizing the minimum. And I wanted to have a relationship with a musician from one to one. So when you proposed it and you proposed the shallow suites, I thought it was, uh, it was a, a, um, to do really like detailed, literally step by step, measure by measure, uh, to discover what all those great capacities of the music of Johann Sebastian Bach are. The structure without being systematic, the rhetorics, this, as you call it, driv dri driving forward, celebration of life with an incredible knowledge of mortality. That's why it's called Mit und Wir in Leben sind. The chaos of emotions that as human beings we recognize and the way you took us by the hand or by the feet or by the or whole body as being the most direct instrument to embody abstraction, you did that in a constant playing uh, uh, by analyzing that music. Uh, there was one thing, as you said, I, I'm, I worked a lot with Bach, but it's something I reveal maybe with a little bit of shame, but I, for example, I never consciously worked with harmony, which is sort of nearly insult to the music of Bach. As you say, it's like the alpha and omega of the music of Bach. And when you were sitting there with us in the studio and doing what you're now doing with the listeners, uh, you, you unfolded this music. And that, uh, that made for me that uh, um, I wanted to have this one-to-one -one relationship with you and with a number of specific dancers I had made. I had mainly worked on, on two particular music, uh, musics, the music of uh, Gérard Griset, 
you know, contemporary music, spectrum music, and otherwise the arsutilio, which is extremely polyphonic music with a high rhythmical complexity. But I wanted to have, uh, I, I wanted to, to draw like one simple line to make what is so specific in this instrument, to embody this in so specific what was in this dancer. Um, as, as I said, why these cello suites? I, I, I like this, there, there are six suites, like just as there are six Brandenburger concertos. We know that the number three is in music, in the music of Bach, extremely important, uh, two times three. Uh, also the, the, the dramaturgy, how everything is extremely structured in its totality structure, but also in the detail. And, and the, the, the pure joy of, of uh, discovering, getting to know this music, how, how Bach in a very direct, technically articulate way, way, shows us how we belong to something that is bigger than we, that is, so this mention und there from, the, uh, from, from Himmel, yeah, that is, I think nothing else that, so clear. And you, you, you found to us this balance very much to, to explain it to us and to let it float uh, as well in the whole rehearsal process as when we were on stage. Oh my God, I talk too much. No, it's wonderful. It's also for me a, a throwback, apart from the very generous words uh, you said about me, and I'm trying not to blush too much. But, um, well, and I, I, I want to, to, my, my, to, to uh, use the throwback uh, feeling that I have now as well uh, of all this work we did together. By the, by the way, I do a little parenthesis for our viewers and listeners. Unfortunately, the show was not filmed. It was, there was a plan um, at some point to film a performance, um, but something came in between and it couldn't be done. Uh, but there is a wonderful uh, documentary about this, uh, all this process that Anne Teresa uh, was mentioning, all this work we did over more a period than more than a year before the, the premiere, uh, by uh, Gerhardian Kleis and Olivia Rochette. And the, the documentary is just called Mitten, uh, the German word for middle. Um, and you can find uh, this in DVD. I know that it's available uh, for sale on the shop of Rosas, so on the online shop of Rosas. So I, I encourage you if you are interested. In, I, f I find they did an incredible uh, patient and um, very sensitive work in, in showing how the, the interaction and how we uh, this um, this was built and how you and Teresa constructed your your grammar on the on the music of Bach, um, which was so inspiring. My my next question, and Teresa, would be um, about this. I, for me, the since I had this we. I think something like 60 performances uh, of, 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 our, uh, of this show, of this uh, um, spectacle. Um, uh, through that, the bar suites have become almost a chamber music piece for me. So uh, it was in incredible and of course, very, a very tangible influence on my playing to not be by myself, but have other protagonists with whom I am interacting like I would be interacting with other players, with other musicians. So I, because there is, there was this relationship on stage of uh, timing, you know, uh, uh, sometimes you, you, the dancers uh, would, uh, would give me an input uh, either by stretching a little bit more or by give me, giving me a sign that I had to, you know, that I had to go on or something. And, and sometimes it would be me who had the possibilities uh, for, for example, I'm thinking now of the galanterie, of the, 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 the gavotte, the bourré, where I had the possibility to sometimes let you wait a little more. So really there was this interaction, suddenly this piece was a chamber music piece for me, and this was wonderful. And what I loved, and this I want to share with the, with the viewers and listeners, is that you, um, I, I never heard, uh, oh Jean Guillen, you have to blame this tempo, because like we know it can happen and and it is not a critic but sometimes dancers have learned 
a certain pattern and they have to do that, them in a certain tempo. So sometimes we, we would dialogue about the tempo and, and, and this, but I could, as much as when I play by myself, uh, improvise, play with the time and, and do this. Um, and I, I guess, and that's my question to you, that uh, this might be because you, as a choreographer, very often you have uh, privileged working with live musicians as opposed to recording and 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 you make sense of it you really uh, want this interaction you really want th the risk that it implies but also the life that it brings in that you have uh, the musician with you on stage yeah what do you want me to say what I want me to say is that yes and it's a sheer pleasure and miracle because in French they has a beviroco. How do you say that when you see a lot of good things? But it, it's absolutely true, but it, it, it has been sheer pleasure to do this with you on stage. And the, the interaction is from both sides. It was really dialogue, dialoguing. Um, I, I think also where also, we, we had intervals, big intervals with, with the performance, where sometimes we didn't perform for several months. And then you came back and with a minimum of rehearsal, we found each other back. We find each other back. Uh, um, I, I think that there is one thing, of course, is that the, the main part of the suites are, are solos, the choreographic writing is solos. So that interaction between two persons is easier as when you're with ensemble work. You know, the, the, the individual freedom in a duetting between a musician and a dancer is, um, is easier as if you're with a, a string quartet, you with, work with counterpoint in a mm -hmm. different way. But yes, mm -hmm. it, it is the very essence, the DNA of uh, working with live music. It's more dangerous, it's more exciting, it's more rewarding. And when there is a, a, a mutual understanding it is a mutual understanding and physically inspiring each other in about the immediate choices you make. But I also think we can do that because we, know, we both, you, sh you shared with us and I shared with you the underlying structure of the, the choices we made. Like for example, the baseline you wrote out, you recorded, you know, all the baselines which are typical for a cello player and I worked with this principle, my walking is my dancing, one step, one note, one step, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, I knew why you were playing it like this. We knew as dancers why you were playing it this, and you knew why we were dancing like that. So we shared, when we deviated from the initial choreographic choices we made, you, you, it was like we, we shared the secrets which makes playing and the sharing even more exciting. Well, uh, Teresa, I wish, uh, I would love to spend an hour talking about many things. I, have so many, I had written many questions, but I just got a, a little message from the wonderful Idagio team that we do have uh, to bring this uh, to an end. So I want to thank you a million times. That was wonderful. And um, who knows if, uh, if you have the time, maybe we could pursue in a future episode <laughs> uh, the, the, the other questions I had for you. Um, dear listeners, dear viewers, thank you so much for being here today. Next time is Tuesday, uh, 5.30 this time, not the same time, 17.30 uh, European time. And I will talk about uh, the Allemande of the first suite, uh, but uh, also probably I will uh, uh, come back to what I didn't have to, time to say about the prelude and about your questions, about the wonderful questions and feedbacks that you send me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne Teresa. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.